explain, we are in a series that really talks about the heart of our church, the very heartbeat, if not, of our church as Christians here called to Squad Community Church. Sometimes, you know, as we talked about last week, a lot of people think that, oh man, you know, this is, it's a cool name, it's a fad name, you know, until it really starts coming down to like shaping quality unified, authentic disciples, then people are like, wait a minute, I thought we were just going to hang out on corners and just tell people and just scream Jesus everywhere and just be radical, but we were like not really going to go deep into being Christians, you know what I mean? And then when we start going through it, it's like, I'm not ready for that. I just wait a minute, just time out just a little bit, and, uh, and then we go from there. And so I'm definitely excited for tonight. As we talked about last week in, in regards to shaping, how many people learned some stuff out of shaping last week? We see the potter just at work in our lives, shaping us, and yes, shaping us, and, and literally just molding us to the people of God that he wants us to be. And so shaping is very crucial. If you missed that sermon, you can go on our Facebook page or our YouTube page and catch that sermon sermon. And so in light of that sermon, we now move to quality. Somebody say quality. quality. Amen. And so today's sermon, as you guys, the title of, as you guys can see on the screen is qualified to produce quality. Can we all say that? Qualified to produce quality. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord God, for this time. We thank you for your grace, God. We thank you, Father, that you are our potter. And as we declared last week and declare even today, we are the clay and the work of your hands. We ask God that today, God, that you would continue to shape us, continue to mold us, that we will be quality Christians as you have called us to be, God. We pray for your wisdom and your knowledge and understanding. We ask, Holy Ghost, that you would take your place and that you will speak mightily tonight to every heart and to every mind, to every soul in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody says, Amen. 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 Praise God. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. And so the definition of quality and, and uh, quality to word is defined as peculiar and essential character, an inherent built in feature. A distinguishing attribute, characteristic, which means revealing, distinguishing, or typical of any individual. And so quality then is the feature that describes the kind of person you are that is derived from the type of character that is built within you. I want to say that again. Quality then is the feature that describes the kind of person you are that is derived from the type of character that is built within you. And so it is what drives you to do your best. It is what drives you to do your best in the things you invest your time, talents, and gifts in with the intent to build essential relationships. Let me explain that. Anytime that you see an individual working at the job, right? We have, we have drivers here, UPS drivers, FedEx drivers. We have all type of, you know, carpenters. We have, you know, people doing administrative assistance stuff. We have people working in schools. We have people, you know, doing all type of stuff inside the church, right? Truck drivers and, you know, people doing makeup and massages and, and all these other things, right? Uh, physical therapists and, and, and folks that work with lawyers and all the time what's happening, even people that work in manufacturing companies that, that, that manufacture and go down the, uh, what is that, uh, the, the line called what's the line called? Assembly line. the assembly line thank you like assembly line workers right even in that sense there is quality being produced and any time that you see quality being produced in any of these jobs or even in our marriages or wherever that is the reason why an individual wants to produce quality is because it's always essential to relationships if a job let's say uh the motor job right which which motor one you you, you working at Ford, right? Let's say Ford. Ford begins to make parts for its cars and it's making four cars. But the quality of the car, if it begins to lack off, guess what? The relationships that Ford has are going to begin to be severed. And look, I'm good with Ford. Y'all making these doors, man. They're flying open, man. Y'all trying to make like suicide doors. People are literally fly, falling out these doors. Not saying it's happening, just hypothetically speaking, right? You guys are making brakes, you know what I mean? The car doesn't want to stop. The engine is, is locking. Whatever it is, antifreeze, you know what I mean? The cooling system. If it's not made with quality, how many people know people are going to stop buying those cars? 
right? Now I'm not going to go back and forth with Ford and Chevy. Y'all have their own argument on your own. Go on, on you uh, on Facebook and then invite me in there so I can see the argument. But at any rate, we don't know who's you know creating and producing more quality than the other. But the fact of the matter is, is that quality is happening because quality is essential to relationships. When an individual stops receiving quality, whether it be in a marriage, whether it be in any kind of relationship, even a job working relationship, guess what? That relationship is going to start to fail. It's going to fail for the simple fact there is no quality coming off. How many people know, right? My wife, right here, uh, baby, if you can raise your hand real right, right fast, right? Beautiful, awesome, right? Wife right here, right? Pastor Carmen Ramos right here. How do you guys, how much you guys know that if I stop producing quality in this marriage, my wife is not going to be happy? How many people know we're not going to sleep good at night? We may not even sleep in the same bed. I may be in the couch, even though sometimes the majority of the time I'm on the couch anyways, you know, bodily issues or whatever. But the moment quality is removed and she begins to feel like, wait a minute, the reward system here in this marriage is not adding up. I'm giving quality and making all these good foods for you and doing all these other things for you and feeding you breakfast in bed and all these other things. But then what I get in return is just a jerk. It's just a person responding to the quality that I'm investing into this marriage is opposite of the quality that I'm giving. And all the time what you would have is the essential relationship of marriage begins to get broken down. Why? Because the quality that I'm putting in is not the same quality that I'm getting out. Many people know what I'm talking about. Quality. And so a person attempts to do all things in excellence because the goal is to show the type of character one has that would reveal the quality of that individual. From our jobs to our marriages and the way we interact with people at Walmart and Target. How many people love Walmart and Target, right? Hallelujah, I'm the only one. It's okay, I, I shop there, man, I get down. And so Walmart, Target, right? Our objective is to give the best qualities of our character to others that will always affect, listen to this, the relationships both personal and societal. We may never even see these people again that we, that we meet at Walmart or Target. But for whatever reason, inside of us, we have an inkling to produce the best quality ever. This person may be taking long in the register or whatever, like Walmart. How many people know Walmart always has long lines? It don't matter what they can do. They can come out with a flying system. It don't make a difference that the cash register will literally come to you and there'll still be long lines in there. It won't make a difference. But all in all, people are still trying to even deal with those individuals with quality. So we have the quality of patience. We have the quality of kindness. We have the quality of soft skills. That even though we're in a long line and we're waiting and we finally get up to the person and we look at them and the whole time, you know, we're talking about them, we're so frustrated. Like all I wanted to do was get pampers and leave the building. Why am I here as though I'm buying half the store? And so we start looking at the person like it's their fault. And then you come to realize that person is just training. How many people went through that? And then you feel all dumb because in your mind, you weren't producing the quality that God would have you to do. And so what do you try to do? You try to make up for it by being nice. How you doing? How's your training going? How you holding up? Quality is the things that we want to give. Because no matter if we know the person intimately or know the person personally, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we want to produce the best quality. And so as Christians then, if shaping is that which comes by the hands of the potter who is God on the clay, who is the believer with the intent of creating a masterpiece and vessel that has a purpose, then quality is the byproduct of the vessel created by God and for God to the world. Just as God begins to shape us as we talked about last week and, and does what he needs to do within our lives, from that, that particular clay that he creates a masterpiece and a vessel with, byproduct of that is quality. It's character that comes out of that that he begins to create inside of us. It is attributes that reflect the very potter to whom created us. And so Paul, right, speaks in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Very, very familiar verse for many of us who've been around the church for some time. In the Amplified Version, it says this. Therefore, if anyone, is there anyone inside this house? Is there an anyone here? Amen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, right? You guys hear all the ends in here in the Amplified Version? There is one, two, three ends so far that all talks about in Christ Jesus. Three of them. He is a new creature, reborn, 
renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things. Somebody say new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new life. Why is that important, Pastor Steve? Well, let me give you a breakdown of what was going on in Corinthians. He was speaking to the Corinthian church, spoke of them, and every person who has put their faith in Jesus as being new creatures in and through Jesus Christ. If you know anything about the Corinthian church, they were a jacked up church. They were a church that prized themselves because of the area they were at in sexual immorality. It was a whole bunch of that going on. In fact, there was an individual that was inside the church that was actually sleeping with his wife's, with his, with his dad's ex-wife. And so there was a type of incest that was going on there. And so it was sexual immorality that was, that was dominant in the Corinthian church. And yet in the middle of these sins and the things that were going on, people were being disfellowshipped, all type of things were going on. In the middle of this, in chapter 5, Paul brings up this verse that would almost seem contradictory to the actions that were happening in that church. And he says, if any man or woman is in Christ Jesus, he is born again. He is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. It's interesting to say that because he's saying that in the midst of so much sin happening within the church. In fact, when you open up that church and he begins to speak to that church, you would think that his church was on point. And you would have to ask him, how is it that in the first chapter he said all these other good things, but by the time you get to chapter three, you're like, wait a minute, these dudes are... They all jacked up, man. Like they living in like Sodom and Gomorrah type stuff. Like it's so weird. But there's a reason why. And the reason why is because he wasn't talking about their own qualifications. He was talking about them being qualified because they were in Christ Jesus. Some of us inside this room, the reason why we cannot produce quality is because we have forgotten who has qualified us. It is the fact that we are qualified that allowed us to produce quality. Can I get an amen? amen? And so declaring that the old life, along with its qualities, characteristics, and attributes, have been reborn and renewed because the old things have passed away and the new things have come, as one has been spiritually awakened that brings new life, the question is this. Why do we not see quality Christians? Why don't we see quality Christians that exhibit peculiar or distinctive and essential character which should be built in us by the Spirit of God according to this verse as a feature and a distinguishable attribute. What is distinguishable? What's the word mean distinguishable? Very noticeable. If I had a, 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 a pimple right here that just kind of stuck out like another little head, like a finger, that's distinguishable. You look at me the whole time. You're not even looking at me. You're just looking at like, what is on the pastor's cheek right there? Like, what is that? Or like I have a mole or something like that. And it was like a hair sticking out and I just forgot to shave it this week or something, right? Everybody's going to be looking at the distinguishable, distinguishable mark on the pastor's cheek. And so the thing is, even now, like, because I have a bald head, right, and it's probably shining real bright right now, right? It's probably distinguishable. But y'all, they're all like, like, what does he use on his head? Right? People be asking me that all the time. Like, dude, like, do you have like, like Johnson & Johnson baby oil? You kind of just splash it up there and just kind of like hook it up and stuff, anoint your own hair. Like, what is it? Because it's, the, it's a distinguishable shine. Right? It's okay. I can talk about myself. God is still good, right? And I don't draw off that kind of stuff. But God is good. You know what I mean? So we're talking about Christians having a distinguishable attribute that affects the world and every relationship we are a part of. Why don't we see that? Why don't we see that distinguishable thing or attribute or character within a Christian. My wife asked me a good question today on the way, uh, on the way to church today from coming from Merrill's Park. And she says, man, baby, you know, I think about Jesus saying that, man, we're going to be doing greater things than he did. Like, like people in the world should be like, oh my goodness, man, look at these, these Christians, man, they're amazing, blah, blah, blah. But why is that? Well, the reason why is because Christians are not that distinguishable from the people of the world. They're not that distinguishable. So when you're looking at Christians in Walmart, you cannot tell who the Christians are and who the people of the world are. It's hard to tell. Even in church, you're looking at people in church and you're wondering who in here is not a Christian, right? Because everybody comes down with a Christian face 
to church, right? How many of you know what I'm talking about, right? With the Christian smile and the Christian, you know, hallelujahs and the Christian praise. And it's like, yes, hallelujah. And y'all know just before you came in here, y'all were arguing and somebody almost got smacked. And so, you know, me in the car this way or whatever, right? And so just went from there and you come in, it's like, hey, man, how you doing, man? How's it going? Man, I'm blessed and highly favored. And you look at the husband, husband come in like, I'm good, man. Don't talk to me right now. It's me. <laughs> How is your wife blessed and highly favored and the husband don't even want to say blessed at all, let alone any kind of Christianese words at all. He just wants to sit down, put his hands up and say, God, help me to help her to help me. And it just goes from there, right? And so why is that is because we are so used to operating in the old man that out of the old man, we try to produce quality that is relevant and reaches the standard of the God man. And it would never work. And so God is trying to tell us something here tonight. And I am on a direction here to which God wants to bless us and encourage us and remind us that he is the one who qualifies. And then that leads and that same qualification leads to the production of a quality life within a Christian or a born again man or woman of God. It is because of God that we are who we say we are or he says we are. It is because of God that we're able to produce the kind of quarterly life that others ex exemplify, that others desire, that others envy. The world should be looking at Christians and being blessed by them. The world should be looking at Christians and know automatically by the way they don't respond to the world and the things of the world or the government of the world and all this other wickedness going around, that they know something I don't know. How is it that you can go through such an extreme trial and tribulation and yet still have genuine joy in your life? So this is the questions that we want to produce within the world because it is those questions that cause the world to want to eat the fruits that come from Jesus. And so the reason why I believe that we don't see that is because quality is produced from the knowledge and understanding of being qualified that gives us the ability and confidence to be the Christians, the followers of Jesus that God has shaped us to be. We ask Jesus to come and be inside of us. How many people did that before? Jesus come into my life, save me, right? Make me born again, forgive me my sins. X, Y, and Z, right? That's like a, a norm within the Christian church. But how many of us actually prayed and say, God, help me to be in you? We don't really hear, we don't really hear, we don't really hear about that in the church. We, we hear about God coming to my life, right? Coming to my heart, right? Everybody prayed that prayer one day, right? Some of us thought we were going to fly afterwards, and you never did. And they was like, that prayer did not work for me, Steve. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm still not flying, and I'm still here depressed. But the thing is, I believe what's happening is that we have asked God to come into our life, which the Holy Spirit does come into our life. It comes into our heart. Amen? But the missing link to this, I believe, is the fact that we have not come into Christ. This whole verse of being new and a new creature. It all stems from being in Christ. Not, not once did it say that Christ was in you in here. It was giving us the emphasis and the very premise of what happens to a believer when they are in Christ, that it is them who become new creations. When we don't, when we don't remain or go in Christ and live underneath his you know, umbrella, if you will, right? We are now susceptible to living the way we want to live and trying to live to please God outside of Christ. That would never work at all. The only way that we are saved and made new altogether is the fact that Jesus Christ died for us in our place. He was buried and resurrected the third day to give us everlasting life. The only way we are born again is because God does something that we can never do. The only way we can please God is because God now lives inside of us to please himself but instead, we're so after pleasing ourselves. And we get caught up in the weaknesses and the sinful things of life. And so when we ask Jesus to come live in us without abandoning ourselves to be in Christ, we never truly experience the new creation God has made us in Jesus. He did not just save us. Can I get an amen? All right. He didn't just save us. He didn't just come into our lives to have us turn over a new leaf on life and be like, well, I got a, a, new, a new little gadget part of my utility belt of life that I can use as a hammer now whenever I'm in trouble. I'm going to call on the name of Jesus. And like, bam, 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 I'm going to hit, the, I'm gonna hit the, 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 the nail into the wall. And after I need Jesus again, I'll, I'll pick him up again and call him again. And my utility belt, like we're Batman and Robin or something, right? And, and Jesus is our Robin now, but we got to make sure we're Batman because we ain't taking second best. 
You guys know what I'm talking about? That was always the issue between Batman and Robin. Robin always wanted to be a Batman, but he had to recognize, no, bro, you're Robin. You're my, you know what I mean? You're secondary. You're, you're right there. And so the thing is, we treat God the same way, though. No, God, listen, God, I know I love you. And you love me, but I want to let you know that I'm Batman. And Jesus, you're Robin. And so I'm the one who takes the lead, Jesus. Come on, man, it's my life. It's my will. I can do whatever I want to do with my life. I make my own decisions. I'm Batman. You're Robin. And what happens with Jesus? He ain't having it. Because he would never be nobody's second best. Amen? And so we have to learn tonight to make Jesus the number one. To be in him rather than trying to have him in us. And not I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit living in us. That's, that, obviously, that's what God does to us. But I mean being in us in the sense of making Jesus second and while we still be first. When we come into Christ Jesus, it makes Jesus first in everything. Amen? And so, moving on from there, he literally reforms us, right? Or reprograms us. He doesn't do these things. He doesn't have us just turn over a new leaf, reform us, or reprogram us. No, this is what he does. He literally, somebody say literally, literally. made us new creatures. He renewed us, and he made us born again, which the old man has passed away, or in layman terms, the old man has died. When we do not understand and have a clear knowledge that we have been qualified by Christ to live as a quality Christian, our flesh and old man will unqualify us, leaving us to continue to live and produce the qualities of the old man that is in direct opposition of the new creation and the ability to produce quality based on being qualified by Jesus' finished work in his life, on his cross, in his burial, and his resurrection for you and me. That is what we must recognize. That it is Jesus Christ who has qualified us so that we can produce quality as real Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ. He is the one who does these things. And whenever we step outside of that knowledge or lack that knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, we always default back to the old man. And then the old man begins to tell us this. You are unqualified to preach the word. You are unqualified to even say, God bless you. In fact, going today to church, some of us heard the whisper of the devil or even the whisper of our flesh. And they told us something like this. You're not qualified to worship. Don't go in there on time because you know you ain't qualified to pray. And when you hear the word, you're not even qualified to say amen. You're not qualified to raise your hands up. You're not qualified to sing hallelujah. And the enemy begins to tell you all the ways and things that you're unqualified to do because he knows we have stepped out of Christ and we are now back operating in the old man. And the old man will always tell you, you are unqualified to do these things. He is. You're unqualified to do these things. And you know what happens to us? We begin to believe it. But you know why we believe it? Because we get caught up in sin. We get caught up in backsliding and things like that. And the flesh automatically tells us, now you're unqualified. But see, tonight, Jesus wants to step in to your life again. And he wants to tell you something very simple. And he wants to tell you this. Apart from me, you are, you are unqualified. But thank God that you have an opportunity to come in me so that you can be qualified. No matter what you're going through. You see, the Corinthians were already qualified even though they were going through all the sinful things they were going through. But just because they were going through the sinful things that they were going through, it never removed them from a state of being qualified by God because from the first place, they never earned their qualification from God. It was always given to them free gift by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it is a gift of God. But they forgot that I was never qualified on my own merits. I had been qualified by the merits and the finished work of Jesus Christ. And I believe some people in here and under the sound of my, boy, my voice have forgotten that you were never earned or merited your qualification to be a Christian. It was given to us freely. And because it was given to us freely, we are qualified no matter what happens. And when we forget that we are qualified, we forget the things that come with being qualified by God himself. And so in saying that, 
The definition of qualified is this, is meeting the standards, the requirements, and training for a position. So it's meeting the standards, meeting the requirements, and meeting the training for a particular position, which in the kingdom of God can never meet apart from Jesus and being in Jesus. You see, we can never meet any standard of God's requirements of holiness. We can never meet God's requirements of being in a position in the kingdom of God. We can never go through enough training of our own good works to be saved. And that's what God is trying to say. It can only happen through Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so good news. Colossians 1, 3, and 14, the body of our message says this. And we're going to be focusing on 9 through 14. But I wanted to read all this so you guys can get the context of this. We always thank God. Anybody here thank God? It says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all God's people. The truth and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in Christ. I'm sorry, in heaven. And about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel was bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Apophras, who was their pastor, our dear fellow servants, who is a faithful minister of Christ on, behalf, on our behalf and who, has, who also told, you of your, or told us of your love in the spirit. What Paul began to explain in verses 3 through 8 is the very quality of the Christians he was talking about in, in, uh, in Colossians. He began to list their qualifications of love and faith and how they've been treating other people and how the world, the, the, when the world hears the message, it begins to grow and bear fruit the same way and the same fruit that was grown in Colossians. He first gives the resume of their qualifications to which they were exhibiting to one another as well as into the world. But then he begins to pray after that in verse 9, all the way down to 14, and he starts to explain things that makes this whole thing about quality very, very visible. This reason, somebody say, for this reason. For this reason. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you. Somebody say qualified. qualified. He qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Oh, that's so good news right there. And some of us missed it already. Paul thanked God in prayer for the Colossian church upon hearing what we just described as the quality or characteristics and attributes that the Colossian church displayed which affected every relationship that were connected to them from a true knowledge, understanding, and the wisdom that came from being qualified that produced the quality they exhibited to and in the world as Christians in the form of faith and love. Do you guys see that? So he begins to pray for them. He lifts them up and he, and he speaks of the great qualities of Christian, of, of a kind of Christianity that they exhibited to themselves amongst each other and the whole world. It was a quality of love and faith. It was a quality that had the whole world look at them and wonder, oh, you guys must be Christians, man, but like real Christians, man. I don't see that amongst a lot of people that call themselves Christians, but you guys are, are being so much Christ-like that Paul himself, the greatest evangelist and apostle of all time, comes in and begins to lift up the qualities of them as Christians. Why is that? How is that? And so listen to this. What makes the quality of one's Christianity so effective in the world? That is what, what Paul answered in this, in this section right here. What makes the quality of one's Christianity so effective in the world is what is answered by Paul through his prayer for the Colossian church to which we can learn how to be quality Christians. But to learn this in this section of what Paul is talking about, we must work through what Paul is praying backwards. 
See, Paul has a habit when he speaks and writes these letters to the Corinth, or to churches like Corinthians and Colossians and all these other churches, or, or churches of, of Ephesians and those kind of churches, right? The Philippians. He has a habit of saying things first, but then at that he ends it with what should have been first. You guys understand what I'm saying? So a lot of times when you're reading the, the letters of Paul, sometimes you have to go back to understand what he's saying and read it backwards. And that's what we're going to do today. We're not going to read it, but we're going to break it down backwards. Amen. And so the first thing that we must understand reading this thing backwards or going from the back, from the bottom to the top, all the way back to verse nine is that we must start in verse 12. The word of God says this and giving joyful thanks to the father who has what? qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light to become and produce quality as a Christian that shows through our character and behavior we must first understand that we have already been qualified when you look at this word qualified that is a past tense word meaning it has already happened you are already qualified if you have given your life to Jesus Christ and come under him, he has already qualified you. In fact, he has qualified you even knowing that you were going to sin tomorrow. And he still says, I qualified you. The first thing that we must understand as Christians is that God the Father has qualified us. And so we need to understand, well, what does that mean then? Right? The past tense. When we assume that we are unqualified for whatever reason, we, are, we or the enemy may conjure up, we will always produce a quality that does not reflect the quality of a qualified man or woman in Christ. When we forget that we have been qualified for whatever reason, the enemy may whisper in your ear or your old man may whisper inside your brain or inside your heart. We would always step out of being qualified to an unqualified state that we no longer walk with God because we think we're unqualified to walk with him. And so we have to understand that the first thing that God did was qualified us. And so listen to this. Paul expounds on what being qualified entails. And he tells us this. Number one, in verse 13a, he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He's talking about a realm. When he uses the word dominion, he means a, a type of kingdom. A type of place to which we belong to. A dominion, a dominion is a place where somebody else has authority over you. Where somebody is governing you. Somebody is lording it over you. Somebody is controlling you. You are underneath their quote unquote spell. And in this case, according to being qualified and the details of being qualified, the first one is, is that God in Christ rescued us from the dominion of darkness. In order to truly understand what's going on here is the fact that we had to admit first that we needed rescuing from the beginning. See, the Bible says that we were all born into sin, no matter who we were. We were born into sin, and we were born into a dominion of darkness. Because the moment we were born, sin ran through our blood, ran through our veins, and we needed rescuing. And so Jesus Christ came and he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. The word of God says this in 2 Timothy 4.18. The Lord will rescue me from what? Every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. The problem is this though when it comes down to the rescuing. Mind you, this word again is past tense. Rescued, E-D. What happens is that when you remove yourself from a qualified state of being in Christ Jesus, we now take ourselves to an unqualified state to which we need to be rescued again, so we think. And so we get caught up in the evil realm again from evil attacks by the enemy himself and some of us just by ourselves from the evil flesh to which is trying to come back alive, who is our old man. And so we begin to walk in darkness. And you know why we stay walking in this darkness? Because we think we're unqualified to go back to the light. Because the enemy told you, God rescued you once, he ain't going to do it again. And so you better come up with a different kind of plan because the plan of God is no longer working in your life. And some of us believed it, but Timothy stood on this prayer and he says, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. 
Amen. And so he, he rescued us. When he qualified us, he rescued us so that the, the dominion of darkness and the enemy no longer has dominion in our lives. Number two, verse 13b, he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Brought is another past tense word. And so he, re- he qualified us, number one. He rescued, and then the, 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 the details or the entailing of qualified is that he rescued us, and then he brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. Why is that important? Why does he say it like that? Into the kingdom of the one he loves. You know why? Because the moment we feel that God is not going to rescue us is the moment we stop believing that God brought us into a loving relationship with God the Father. And the moment we stop feeling love from God the Father, we start feeling as though we are no longer operating in the kingdom or in a relationship with God, that we are now outside of a relationship with God and no longer in a love relationship. And when you are no longer in a love relationship with God, you know what we assume? That God hates us. You know God is mad at you. You know God ain't trying to hear your prayers. You know you done messed up. You know you done did X, Y, and Z. Now God doesn't love you anymore because you did all these things. You're sinning, you backslid, you did whatever. And now listen, because God freely brought you into his kingdom, you have to now pay to get into that kingdom. And it never works. Look what the Bible says about the love of God to which we all got to remember. Romans 8, 38 says this down to 39. For I am convinced. Anybody convinced in here? I am convinced that neither death nor life Neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What is Paul saying right here to the Romans? Brothers and sisters in Christ, nobody can separate you from the love of God. Not things in the physical or things in the spiritual, not angels or demons, not sin, not anything else you can think of that will separate you from the love of God. But Pastor Steve, you don't understand the sin I did. Pastor Steve, you don't understand what I went through. Pastor Steve, you don't understand what I what just transpired. You don't understand the sin that I put my hand in. You don't understand the position I took myself in. And God is saying, listen, I don't care about none of that stuff. Nothing will separate me from your love. Nothing will separate me from loving you. Not even the fact of you dying. He said, life or death. You can die and God still loves you. You can live and still be walking dead and he still loves you. You can walk away and try to bury yourself in the sand and God's love will still find you there. And so what is he trying to say? He's trying to say, listen, I qualified you. Because I rescued you and I brought you into a loving relationship with God the Father. But some of you guys forgot that I have done these things for you and you assume that I don't love you anymore. You assume that it's too late for you. And God is saying nothing will separate me from from loving you. Nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so it goes on that the The third thing is, in verse 14, is redemption in Christ. Another past tense word he uses. Redemption. The definition of redemption is this. To free from from what distresses or harms, such as A, to free from captivity by payment of ransom. B, to extricate, I can't even say that word, from or help to overcome something detrimental. C, to release from the blame or debt. Clear and D to free from the consequences of sin. Some of us in this place right now is so caught up in blame, is so caught up in guilt, is so caught up in the consequences of sin as it begins to give you condemnation, as it begins to destroy you, it destroys your bones, as David talks about. It begins to destroy your thoughts, it begins to destroy your heart. David expressed himself when he was caught up in sin that every part of his life it hurt him. Because he felt the consequences of condemnation and guilt and shame. And he didn't know what to do with it. The enemy had him at a place that told him, God will not redeem you. You have messed up too much. You're caught up in sin and you might as well enjoy it now. Because there's no way out. But you have to remember 
that Jesus qualified you. And part of his qualification is that he paid the penalty and he ransomed you in Christ Jesus. And some of us forget that. And when we forget it, we step into an unqualified state. And then we begin to think that the blood of Jesus is no longer flowing for the sins that I have committed. And it's a lie from the devil himself. And so listen, the, the last one is this. Of course, forgiveness in 14b. Forgiveness of sin. When you begin to look at the things that we spoke about, right? Rescuing brought us into a loving relationship. He redeemed us, amen? And then he forgave us of our sins. This is the process of an individual backsliding. This is the process of what an individual goes through when they step out of being qualified in Christ Jesus to now being placed into their old man and defaulted into their old man that would always be unqualified. And when you step into this position right here, you begin to feel the pulling that you're in need of rescuing, but you don't know who to go to anymore because you, quote unquote, burned the bridge with Jesus. Burned the bridge with my pastor, man. I burned the bridge with my brothers in Christ, sisters in Christ, and I can't even call them anymore because I'm in shame. I can't, I can't talk to them. I can't talk to Jesus, man, because he ain't hearing my prayers no more, man. We begin to feel the weights of not feeling the love of God the way we used to feel it. Not hearing the voice the way we used to hear his voice. Not feeling the embrace that he used to embrace us with. And we think that God left us and walked away from us. And as though he doesn't love us anymore. And then from there what happens? We begin to be succumbed by condemnation and the consequences of our sins. We begin to feel guilty and shame. And then we begin to hear the enemy in our flesh telling us you can never pay for what you did. So you might as well have fun. And what you're doing. And then lastly, of course, the last one would be this. Is that we think that we're in a position to never receive forgiveness. And it's all a lie from the devil. Because he gets us to think that we are unqualified. While causing us to forget that we were never qualified by our own merits from the get-go. It was always a free gift. It was always given to you, even knowing that you were going to sin afterwards. You see, you got to remember here. When we go back to the Corinthian church, what happened? They were still qualified, even though they were in the middle of sin. And what happens is that's usually the first step is that when we commit sin, we think that's it, it's over with me. I'm just going to work out, I'm going to clean up myself. I'm going to do my own thing. And then I come back to Jesus and you forget you have a devil out there who is a, a legit professional. He is an assassin to make sure you never be ready. He will make sure you'll never be good enough. He will make sure that you never be cleansed enough. He is a professional. One thing about the enemy that knows that what he's good at is he's good at his job. Got to be honest. He's good at his job condemning us. He's good at his job making sure that we'll never come to Jesus on our own. You know what I mean? Or at least being good enough. He's good at his job to make sure to, to keep telling us, listen, you're not ready. Girl, just sit down. You ain't ready. Chill out, girl. You remember all them sins did in your life? You can't come to God right now. You can't even come to church. And he's like, Mauricio, sit down. You know you ain't, you ain't, even, you ain't even nowhere near ready to give your life to God right now. What about all the stuff you want to do? What about all the dreams you have? What about all the fantasies you have? What about all the, all the sin you want to do? You're not ready to come to Jesus. He lies to us. And he's good at what he does. In fact, the Bible says he is the father of lies. He is not just, just a simple liar like one of us. No, no, no. He is the father of lies. If he's the father of lies, you know what? That means that he is the originator of lies. Do you think being the father, God gave him that, that title. Do you think being the father of lies, that a person's not going to be good at what he does? You've been mistaken. The enemy is good at what he does. And you know what he'll do? It is always, always, always to twist the word of God. Just ever so, just a little bit, just a couple of notches. To twist the word of God. And all of a sudden, we are no longer standing on the word of God. We're standing on the word of man. No, man, it's going to be all right, man. It's going to be, we, I got this. I got this. Don't worry about it. 
And the enemy already knows. I got him. I got him in a place of feeling like he's unqualified. And the only reason why a Christian will feel like he's unqualified is because a Christian is no longer in Christ. The moment you hear anything that sounds like unqualification, you better examine your life and then make sure you are still in Christ Jesus. Because as we're in Christ Jesus, look it, we're qualified. We're able to stand up tall, even though we might have sinned, because it's not a matter of uh, if you sin, it's a matter of when you sin. Even though you have made a mistake, I'm not saying going out there and start intentionally making sins and, and mistakes and all of a sudden we don't ever see you again. I'm not saying that at all. I'm only going on Facebook telling, telling people by saying this. That ain't that. What I'm saying is this. Whenever you do make that mistake, whenever you do fall into that sin, that doesn't remove the qualification to what Jesus did in your life. If anything, because Jesus Christ qualified you and you did commit a sin, it actually leads you to repentance and a confession of that sin. It leads you to a place to recognize, listen, I'm not who I just fell right here. I am not the failure, even though I failed right here. I am not one, you know what I mean? I'm not this person, you know what I mean, just because I made a mistake right here. I'm not this person just because I committed a sin right here. No, I am still qualified in Christ Jesus. Why? Because I can never earn it. It was given to me freely, and God doesn't just take it away. We have to give that thing back. And so it's not God taking it away, it's us giving it back. And so what God is calling us to do according to this and his word is that he's telling us that we are already qualified. We have already, he has already rescued you. He has already brought you into a loving relationship with God. He has already redeemed you. He has already forgiven you. All these words are past tense words. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is what? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And purify us from all unrighteousness. That is a promise from God. It doesn't say, oh, you know, if you keep on sinning, man, yeah, I'm not, not going to forgive you, man. Like, no, nah, if you're dealing with some addictions, no, nope, you're pop, man. Right, nope. You call me when you're done with that. No. He said he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. But he doesn't stop there. And purifies us from all unrighteousness. You know what's unrighteousness that a lot of us don't even consider unrighteous? is when we say things like, I am unqualified, knowing that God already said, you are qualified. When you say things and accept things like, I cannot pray. I cannot go to church right now. I cannot worship God. I cannot do other things. Listen, that is unrighteousness. You know why that's unrighteousness? Because you're calling God a liar. God said over here, you are already qualified in Christ Jesus when you put your faith and your allegiance to Jesus Christ. Why is it that you're over here, all of a sudden God becomes a liar? The Bible says, let God be the truth and let man be the lie. So that when you're in an unqualified state or so you feel, you can recognize the lies that are coming out of your own mouth and recognize that they don't line up with the word of God that came out of God's mouth. And so what is the summary of all this? All these things are things that hinder us from producing and being quality Christians that do all things with excellence from the new character and attributes that Jesus has built in us through new birth. When we do not understand that we have been qualified and the details of these qualifications as we just uh, talked about right now are used to unqualify us, leaving us to produce a quality that only hinders uh, others rather than imparts to others what is to be a real Christian and that from a foundation of being qualified by Christ to be a follower of Christ. How do we remain in this qualified state to continue to produce quality, character, and attributes becoming of a Christian. And that's probably a question right now. Like, man, let's see, like, well, what do we do if we're already messed up? What do we do if we're already, if we're caught up in that, that mindset, man, that I'm unqualified because I did X, Y, and Z? How, how do I get back on? How do I stay in Christ Jesus where I am qualified and I'm walking with him, talking with him, in a relationship with him? How do I stay in that realm, the realm of the kingdom of God? That's a very good question. It's a question I presupposed. And I want to answer right now. Amen? <laughs> what the Bible says right here. Giving, what kind of thanks? Joyful. Giving joyful thanks to the Father. Now we're going to start going backwards here, right? Joyful thanks to the Father. Right? He qualified us. He rescued us. Right? He brought us into a loving relationship with God. 
right? He did after that. He redeemed us all past tense. And then after that, he forgave us all past tense, right? Of the English. When I say past tense, you all know I'm talking about English grammar, right? English grammar, past tense. I, I got to say that because some of us didn't get a high school diploma. I didn't get a high school diploma. I got a GED. And you know what I mean? It just went from there. It's being honest, right? But look what happens here in verse 12. Look at the first word, giving. Not had given, supposed to give. No, no, it's giving joyful thanks to the Father. Why would Paul start off like that? What is he telling us here after he told us all the other good stuff about being qualified? Listen to this. Paul begins this verse with a call to giving joyful things to the Father, as we talked about. Notice that the tense Paul used in the past is not the past tense, which he used with qualified and the details of the Father's qualification, but uses a tense, listen to this, that is neither past nor future. Giving joyful thanks to the Father. That's neither past tense or future tense. But you know what it is? It is ongoing. It is giving joyful thanks to the Father all the time. It is not just the past, not just the future, but it is something that we must constantly do throughout the duration of our life on a day-to-day -day basis. We must give joyful thanks to the Father consistently, ongoing we must consistently be giving, not happy things, right? Notice it doesn't say happy things. Giving happy thanksgiving to the Father. No, it could, because then it will only deal with happenstances or situational or circumstantial. He doesn't say that, right? He doesn't talk about external happenings or happy happenstances. No, no, no. He uses joyful thanks to the Father. Why? Because it's an internal joy of giving thanks to the Father that the Spirit of God has put inside of us. And why is that important? Because this kind of giving thanks to the Father is a giving thanks no matter what's happening on the external. It's a joy that gives you give thanks to the Father because it's something that's happening internally. Why is that important? Why is Paul telling us this? Because I believe he's trying to answer a crucial question about how to remain in Christ Jesus as a qualified Christian to produce quality. And we have to give thanks, joyful thanks to the Father. Not from external happenstances, but internal reasons of joy that comes from the Spirit. And this is why. Because it may incorporate and is not limited to such things as sin, mistakes, failings, backslidings, bad examples of Christian character. You see, if he would have said giving happy thanks to the Father, that would have stopped the moment you sinned. You would have stopped giving thanks to the Father. He didn't say giving happy thanks to the Father because the moment you made a mistake, there goes that thanksgiving to the Father. He didn't say happy thanks, happy uh, giving happy thanks to the Father because the moment you backslid, oh, that thanksgiving is gone. He said giving joyful thanksgiving because joy comes from eternally by the Spirit of God, in spite of your sin, mistakes, failings, backslidings, and back and bad examples of Christian character. Amen. We're able to give joyful thanks to the Father because we recognize on a day-to-day -day basis, on every step that we take, no matter if we slip, no matter if we fall, no matter if we make mistakes, no matter if we end up turning back around and backsliding, that we're able to give joyful thanks to the Father because we are reminded that it was the Father who qualified you in the get-go. It is a matter that makes it about God rather than makes it about yourself. It is a matter that says, God, I will give you joyful thanks, even though I just fell yesterday, even though I just fell this morning, but God, I give you joyful thanks because you have qualified me. You have forgiven me. You have rescued me. You have redeemed me. You have brought me into a loving relationship with God and neither sin, nor death, nor life, nor angels can remove me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Somebody needs to give him some praise in this house because God is worthy of it. And so listen to this. We must constantly, somebody say constantly, constantly, be giving joyful thanks to the Father as we come to know, understand, and apply wisdom in the truth and fact that we have been qualified even while the Father knew we would fall to sin. We would fall to mistakes. We would fail. We would backslide. And we will give bad examples of wrong Christian character on our jobs, on the highway, on the byway, on video games, and whatever else you guys are doing in your life today. And God is saying, listen, you need to go back 
to the heart of joy. And it is a joy that reminds you every single day that God is who he says he is and he will do what he said he will do. And so this is what God says. What keeps us? Where do, we, where do we go after we give thanks to God every single day? What happens after that? Does that mean you're, you're, you're now you know, capable of withstanding sin and everything else? Now, I'm not saying that you are through Christ Jesus, right? But this is not what it says as we go backwards. Now we're in verse 11, going backwards. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. What is he saying? When we remember and give thanks to the Father for his qualification in our lives and making us qualified, it is the very thing that will strengthen us with all power according to his glorious might, not ours, according to his glorious might, so that we may have great endurance and patience, so that we will not give up on producing quality as Christians because we recognize we have been qualified by God himself. The next thing he talks about in verse 10 is this, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, breaking, bearing fruits in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Why is this? Why does he need to let us know about being qualified and all the things that comes with being qualified in Christ Jesus? Why do we must give thanks to the Lord and uh, uh, joyful thanks to God because he has qualified? What gives us, after he gives us the strength and endurance and patience, why does he do all these other things? So that we may live a life worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in every way. How does that look like? It looks like, praise God. It looks like a Christian producing quality in their character and their attributes that shows God who lives in heaven and brings them down to earth through our very life. See, the world is looking for quality Christians. Quality Christians. Why is that? Because of these next words right here. Bearing fruits in every good work. You know why the world needs to see quality Christians? And why we stand on that as a church? Because when we go out there to live out our life as Christians in the world, in the workplace, at home, in front of our landlords and everybody else and their moms and dads and cats and dogs and whatever else, right? Listen, we bear good fruits. Why does God want us to bear good fruit? Because what do people do with good fruit? They eat it. They crave it. They want it. And when they begin to see quality Christians they see a fruit within the quality Christians that they want to eat. They want to consume. I want what you have. You're bearing these fruits in spite of what's going on with COVID-19 and crazy old governmental systems and all these other things that are going on. But yet you're still bearing good fruit. And it's a fruit that is attractive. I can see the sweat on this fruit in a desert and I crave it. I want this fruit. I want to eat the juices of this fruit. And what does that fruit produce within another other person? Quality, Christian, living, when you start to tell them that they are only qualified by Jesus Christ themselves, just as we are. And so it is in that sense that we get to bear fruit in every good work as a quality Christian. And then how do we continue to grow? In the knowledge of God. This knowledge is a knowledge of experiential. experiential. Amen? Somebody say experiential. And so it says, growing in the knowledge of God. It's not head knowledge, but it's the knowledge of experiencing life with God himself. And that's just not in the victories. It's also in the defeats. It is growing in our experience and walking with God to such a degree that when I have victories, I learn about my God. When I have defeats, I learn about my God. When I make mistakes, I learn about my God. When I'm caught up in sin, I learn about my God. When I'm caught up in mistakes, I learn about my God. Some of us are assuming that we're supposed to be victorious, which we are. But it is in those defeats. Other people, Christians, experience defeats. Why did God allow them? Because they had to learn and experience God, not just in the good times and the mountain highs. But what about in the valley lows when you're all by yourself and you're caught up in sin? See, it is that time that God wants to reach you, right? He wants to reach us in a certain place so that we can experience him. Not just as a good father when everything's going good, but even when we sin, we experience the knowledge of God as he reminds us, son, get back up. Daughter, get back up. Oh, God, you got to leave. I'm not worthy of you, God. I'm not worthy of you, God. And God is like, listen, I just want to remind you 
I qualified you, even knowing that today you were going to commit this sin. I, I rescued you, even, I, even though I knew I would be having to rescue you for the rest of your life. I brought you into a relationship with me, in a love relationship, even though I knew you were going to cheat on me with the world. Even though I knew you were going to commit adultery and go back into the world, I still brought you into a loving relationship with me. Even though I redeemed you, I knew I would have to redeem you time and time again because you would always go back to Egypt and be, become a slave again. And he says, listen, I forgave you your sins, even though I know that I will be forgiving your sins for the rest of your life. God desires for us to experience him. And not just when everything is peaches and cream, but even at the lowest of lows within our lives. It is God who meets us there. And it's in those times that we grow in the knowledge of God. In the dark times, we recognize, God, how do you still love me, God? I was in one of the darkest moments of my life. And I've told you guys this many of times. And the prophet comes to the house of God. And in our old church, they had us lined up. And I'm lined up. I got my hat on because I was in shame. And I'm lined up. And I'm like, oh, I got, I'm in tears. And I'm like, and this guy's on the money, man. He's telling people their whole life. And I'm just like, oh, God. This guy's going to tell me how horrible I am how much I suck, how much I, I messed up and the things that I did. And I'm getting closer and I'm getting closer and I'm getting closer. Man, I can hear him just talking to people in their life and it's just like, and I know these people. So I'm like, man, this dude's telling the truth on them. And I'm getting closer and closer. And it's just like, I start feeling my heart kind of just sink. You guys know what I'm talking about because y'all make it seem like y'all just never sin there like that. Like, man, Steve, you're on your own with that one. I've been holy since I've been saved. And so I get closer and closer to this, to this guy. And finally, I'm in front of him. And he just looks at me. And he grabs my hat. He takes it off my head. And he says, what is your name? And I put my head down. I said, my name is Stephen. And he looks at me. And he says, I got a word from God from you. And I'm just like, oh, man, this guy's just about to tell on me. And everybody in this room is going to hear this. Because right? I was trying to keep a low key between me and like the leaders and stuff, right? And I'm like, my goodness. And so, you know, he tells me, keep in my head. I look at him, and he just tells me this. He says, God wants me to tell you that I'm proud, that he's proud of you. Oh. I mean, that thing hit me so hard because I never expected it. I mean, I was at the lowest of lows at this time. And he did this to me he did three times so far in my life. At the lowest of lows, when you think that, man, God hates me right now with my wife and my kids right now because I'm messed up. And he looks at me and tells me the complete opposite right into my eyes. And he says, God wants me to tell you that he's proud of you. And it was almost like God grabbed my heart and he made it beat again. It was just like, your heart can beat again, my son. You think that I look at you the way you look at yourself. And I just want to remind you that I look at you totally different with the eyes of love that burns for you in spite of what you did. Because I want to remind you that I'm the one who qualified you. You didn't qualify yourself. I knew you were going to be here standing before this prophet. I knew you were going to go through X, Y, and Z. And I knew that in spite of all this, I will look at you in your face and tell you, I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you. After that, I had to ask God the question, Lord, how dare you? I feel so offended and so like, I don't deserve that. You know, we can not deserve something to such a degree that almost makes you upset because you're so confused. Like, why in the world would you tell me that, God? And you know what he tells me? It took months until another prophet comes in. I haven't seen this dude in so long. And he grabs me and he says, hey, you've been asking the question to God. And I'm like, okay. So he, he tells me, he says, listen, you know why God tells you that he's proud of you? This dude doesn't even know me. He don't even know what I'm going through. But he tells me just like that. You know why God said he's proud of you? And I said, why, bro? Because he knows your end from your beginning. He knows what you're going to do for the kingdom. He knows how you're going to be. 
He knows what the, the people that you're going to reach and the people that are going to get saved because of you. He knows how much you're going to love him in spite of what goes on in your life. He knows what you're going to endure and persevere. He knows what your marriage is going to go through. He knows what you're going to go through when nobody's looking and you're in your bed and you're crying the tears and you're wondering, does God even care? And God is saying, yes, I do. And I love you. No matter what you have done, because I have seen the end from the beginning. I see you partying with me on streets of gold. I see you joining me in the feast of this land, supper of the land, sitting there eating the food to which I have given you. I have seen those things. And because of that, I can say I'm proud of you. If we all can stand. Paul closes this section with what he, we're going to close with what he began when he says this in verse 9. For this reason, somebody say for this reason. Since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through the, all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives you. He said, we don't stop because of this reason that God has qualified you and he wants you to be a quality Christian. We keep on praying for you nonstop. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, in the Amplified Version says this very simply. Not that we are sufficiently qualified in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency and qualifications come from God.